pay my respects to the traditional owners of this country, past, present, and emerging, acknowledging that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was, and it always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you to all the, the comrades that have been involved in organizing this webinar across um, continents with our fraternal comrades from the Communist Party of the United States, the Communist Party of Britain, and of course, uh, my own comrades here in Australia from the Communist Party of Australia. It is a very interesting topic that it is out there, and this is one of the ways we use to resist the media the propaganda, the, the propaganda machine that it is out there is spreading the misinformation uh, very often about the situation in the Indo-Pacific, uh, about China in particular. And often uh, this type of war uh, media campaign that it is based on lies or misinformation, and more and more often requires that the uh, progressive forces, the anti-war, the peace movement, continue to develop and continue to host these type of events uh, to be able to discuss the facts of what is happening out there and what we need to do to mount a broader campaign for peace, anti-war, for mutual cooperation in the benefit of working people and people in general the, of the world and for us specifically here in the, in the Pacific. The recent developments we have seen uh, the United States trying to fix an economic problem by military means trying to increase uh, the military expenditure, uh, the pivot to the Pacific, the imposition of the 2% of GDPs for military budgets that really, yes, undermine the, the position of the working people in our countries with money that needs to be spent on social services and hospitals, schools to be prepared for for a, a pandemic like the one we live in today, um, that is the people, the one that suffers, would always be. And the more disadvantaged are the ones who are in, in the situation. Um, most recently, of course, we have been following with the news, the propaganda machine continue to misinform people, again, based on lies about the situation in the Ukraine, the, the Russian, imminent attacks on the Ukraine. All of this that tend to put people in our countries, you know, on, on, a, on a difficult uh, scenario where they don't know what to believe and the propaganda machine continues here in Australia, for example, to try to put in people's minds that, you know, the necessity to uh, a military response to the necessity to sign deals like the AUKUS that, you know, most probably our speakers will talk about today and this new Cold War uh, on, on China and I will say it also on, on Russia. So for, for today, what are we taking the opportunity that we got a few participants still signing in uh, as usual in this type of um, uh, events, asking uh, uh, people to keep uh, the microphones off unless you are talking, uh, for the attendees to keep the, the videos uh, switch off. Uh, that's to uh, allow the, uh, the online system to work a little bit better and to, you know, to have a, a good discussion. Uh, we I would like to encourage uh, the uh, participants to use uh, the Q&A to post the questions there. If you wish to ask a particular question to a, a particular speaker, to note it there. Or in general, 
if the question comes, uh, I will invite any of the panelists to respond. Uh, everybody could chip in uh, from the, their perspective. And if obviously people use the chat and there are a few questions there, we will try to monitor the chat as well and read aloud uh, those, those questions. Um, it is the best option because in the webinar, it is difficult to see if people raise their hand. So really we encourage people to use the Q&A. &Q um, I would like to introduce my comrade, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Australia, Comrade Andrew Irvin. Comrade Andrew is a rail worker based in Melbourne. And he gave a, a quick intro about the, the situation that we, we, you know, the subject of the discussion today. And then we're going to get um, the speakers in the order that we have advertised uh, with Comrade Duncan Mafalan from the Communist Party of the United States, Comrade Kenny Coyle from the Communist Party of Britain, and our Comrade Roland Boy from the CPA. Uh, again, I thank you for the effort. I don't know the timelines. I know that for some of us it's very early, for others it's late in the afternoon or evening. So thank you very much for this. This is the way we continue to strengthen the fraternal relationship among our parties and the way that we in our countries represent the interests of working people. And we continue to live for peace against war and for social change that can bring about a best, a better future for the people in our countries. So I thank you again for being here. Now, Comrade Andrew, would you like to, to uh, introduce the comrades and the subject? Thank you. Uh, thank you, comrades. Um, I won't necessarily introduce the speakers. Um, I think comrades will have seen that. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Wunjuri and Burrawong people of the Kulam Nation and acknowledge that we meet on their stolen lands. I would like to start with some comments from Winston Churchill on the Cold War's three-part strategy. Military strength to balance the Soviet armies in the face of allies that are demobilizing after World War II. Dialogue with Russia to prevent antagonism from becoming war, particularly in nuclear war. The United States of Europe, both for recovery from the destruction of World War II and to harmonize relations among European states so that further continental bloodshed must be avoided. To cooperate, the cooperation of Britain, the United States, and the new um, United Nations would be needed to create the sinews of peace. Churchill advocated managing Cold War tensions with a view towards a favorable mutual resolution. While the United States took a more confrontational stance, threatening massive retaliation with nuclear weapons and adopt, adopting a deterrent policy of mutually assured destruction. These opening comments from one of the leading advocates for the Cold War and the maker of the Iron Curtain speech present the principal lie. The, the objective was to di dictate power and the propaganda model of threats, intimidation, which has always been an aggressive essential part of Cold War strategy till today. Considering the post-war threat, the Eastern Bloc presented to a world, uh, considering the post-war threat, the Eastern Bloc presented to the world, a, was presented to a world where the newly victorious Western nations believed they had a right to the potential spoils of war. It was a time of capitalist expansion and influence from an emboldened new superpower that was at the center of providing the capital, capital and markets 
for post-war renewal and huge profits. It was also, however, the epoch of a, a now greatly expanded group of Eastern Bloc worker states helped and in alliance with the Soviet un Union. Numerous empowered national liberation move movements, a significant anti-colonial campaign and opportunities for the peoples of many nations to uh, fight for representative and ind independent democratic governments that was a palpable and ge general feeling that anything was possible. Yet under the threat of the Cold War propaganda machine and fear to comply, the imperialists, the imperialists instituted a terrible crime, murdering and repressing millions of people from peoples from many countries to maintain its domination, take power, protect their businesses and dicta dictate the future. What is the meaning and culture of the capitalist, capitalist systems Cold War policies? Overt aggression, use of hot war and Churchill's view towards a mutual, a, a favourable mutual resolution. The threat and historic, historical fabrications, demands, deception and manufactured incidents are all hallmarks of the deteriorating spiral and actions directed at destabilising and creating chaos that leads to the breaking up and destruction of society that results. All activity systematically implemented to stop the development of progressive and independent peoples, not uh, independent peoples. The re reality of these contradiction, of this re uh, contradiction raises from these political, the re reality of these, of this contradiction that arises from these political confrontation confronts us on a daily basis. Only by the application of a class approach to these policies and an understanding of the political nature of the liberation struggle, including the incorporation of many successes and defeats can, can act, from this can activists obtain the tools that must be used to unite and strengthen the movement and provide it with what is needed to build and to politicise the workers' movement, a movement powerful enough to achieve a permanent victory against the imperialists and its toadying agents. China in its, in its current principle, uh, China is the current principle contradiction that confronts the imperialist system that was led by a fading power, superpower in a multipolar strategic world. China's economic success and power that has dedicated itself to the absolute eradication of po poverty while achieving economic growth, despite the disruption caused by the pandemic. At the same time, it, it has made a commitment to achieve carbon peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. They will also not build any more coal-fired projects abroad. In the third symposium on the development of the Belts and Roads Initiative in Beijing in November 2021, President Xi Jinping addressed the concerns about how China will continue its high quality development of the Belts and Roads Initiative in the face of changes at home and abroad by outlining new development visions based on deepening political uh, mutual trust and policy dialogue. Would the imperial states commit themselves or their signif significant resources to create a network work that spans land, sea and air, transport as well as cyberspace that is not based on exploitation or domination but cooperation in both traditional and new infrastructure. 
rules and standards that provide a transparent, respectful and sustainable alliance among participating countries. The Belt and Road Initiative will enable new areas of cooperation and new growth. Despite the challenges and uncertainty, there are also new demands for international cooperation. There is a great need to unite in fighting the pandemic, achieving environmental protection and a green and low carbon development. Digital te technology will be more widely used in a post epidemic world and as international be, uh, cooperation becomes more urgent. The Belt and Road Initiative was created to serve the people. It will also step up cultural exchanges to strengthen people to people links. At the same time, it will initiate more projects to provide the livelihoods of people living in Belt and Road countries so they could have a greater sense of fulfilment. Commitment to the Belts and Road Initiative will be made by many developing countries which are only too willing to accept. While the West can only respond with threats, interference and sa sanctions, propaganda, foreign interference and fake news are all part of the imperialist war machine. In a statement made by this week by Gennady Zaganov on behalf of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation regarding the provocations of the United States around the Ukraine situation. He said, in recent weeks, the situation around the Ukraine has sharply worsened. Accusations are poured in of Russia's intention to act as an occupier. In fact, the reason for the crisis is that the Washington puppet master, ma master of Kiev leadership and Barbara's, Barbara's formation are persistently trying to organise a massacre in Donbass for the sake of solving their geopolitical problems. They are already are ready to arrange another large scale bloodshed. The West categorically does not want to see the concentration of military units of the Ukrainian army on the border of the Donbass and Lugas People's Republics. Almost all combat ready units of the armed forces of the Ukraine are deployed on this territory. 125,000 soldiers and officers, heavy artillery, tank units, are all drawn into the same zone. Alas, the United States and its vassals in Kiev are fanning the fire of a fanatical war. Western governments and their cleavers in Kiev tra trampled on the minced agreement at this extremely alarming moment in our history. At the moment, recent meetings of the leaders of the NATO alliance and alliances that own owes its whole existence to the policies of anti-communist aggression, new Cold War rhetoric was abundant. NATO's General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg even said that the rise of China presents a security threat to NATO. Why does the world's largest country lifting itself out of po poverty constitute a security threat to the NATO powers? The answer is it doesn't. It does, however, constitute a threat to the US hegemony and capitalist profit. The world cannot be allowed to descend into an anti-communist Cold War. Despite the name of the Cold War of the 20th of the 20th century was more often than not a hot war and cost the lives of millions of people around the globe. From the Southeast Asia, from Southeast Asia to Africa and Latin America, millions of workers, those seeking freedom and a better world for themselves 
and their families were slaughtered in the name of global capitalism. These wars did not spare the young of the US and its military allies. History cannot be allowed to repeat itself in an ever more dangerous form. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Andrew, for that broad introduction. Uh, it made me to reflect on the words by President Biden recently on wars of choice. Certainly, the United States have chosen to invade many countries. I think that most countries in Latin America could um, affirm you know, the, the results of the foreign policy of the United States in Latin America and elsewhere uh, around the world, most recently, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, um, the situation in Syria. So uh, now here in our area, with the Asia Pacific, with the Deter Pacific Deterrence Initiative, we are the turning most of the resources to this part of the globe. Um, it is, uh, I, I would like to mention that um, we got uh, attendees from the United States, from Liverpool in uh, Britain, and obviously from all cities in Australia. So welcome to all the attendees. Uh, we're going to listen now to one of our keynote speakers, uh, Comrade Duncan McFarlane uh, from the CPUSA. He's currently chair of the China-Vietnam Subcommittee of the Peace and Solidarity Commission of the CPUSA. He was an anti-war activist in the 60s and first visited China on a U.S.-China friendship tour in 1981. He became manager of the China Exchange Delegations Program and editor of the U.S.-China Review. From 2008 to 2017, he was coordinator of the China Discussion Group at the Center for Marxist Education in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2021, Duncan edited the volume A China Reader, published by Change Maker Publications. His last solidarity visit was in 2017. So with this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Comrade Duncan McFarlane. Thank you, Comrade. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I want to thank our uh, host, CP Australia, and also CP Britain and the other countries who made this discussion possible. So I, I assume you can hear me. Let me know if there are any, any problems. Um, the the uh, title of uh, my talk is the Biden administration's imperialist China policy and the Taiwan issue. I want to address the topic with three points. One, what is the Biden administration's China policy after one year? Two, how effective is that policy? Three, the Taiwan issue. Number one, what is Biden's China policy? Biden's policy is essentially a doubling down of the aggressive strategy of seeking global hegemony, which means a strong anti-China component uh, as China is its main perceived long-term rival and adversary. While given the Ukraine events, Russia may become a prime adversary in the shorter term. The Trump administration launched a trade war, which hasn't worked very well. While some damage was done to Huawei mobile phones and Xinjiang cotton, China's basic economic and international trade position today continues to be overall strong. Biden shifted to a full spectrum attack on human rights and an ideological and propaganda war focused on false and extravagant claims about genocide of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Both administrations have tried to block China's acquisition of high technology, its access to computer chips and sales of 5G equipment. Both administrations have continued provocative displays of air sea military power in the South China Sea even with risk of conflict or war. Biden may have left himself an out if there is a change in approach as he articulates rhetoric upholding one China, 
However, he continues actions to support Taiwan independence, which opposed one China, and says he is against a new Cold War while actively pushing it. How do we explain this basic continuity of US imperialist policy towards China? The weapons manufacturers and the military industrial complex profit immensely when there is a fearsome enemy, thus acquiring expensive new weapon systems is a necessity. The colossal sums appropriated by the US Congress to the military machine made big profits for Wall Street banks. And neocon analysts at right-wing think tanks are pleased to identify China as a principal enemy. We need to look at strategy towards China in a larger context. The so-called Biden doctrine depicts a historic global struggle between democracy and autocracy for the defense of freedom and the future of the world. The US presumes to consider itself as the leader of the democracies and also defines what is a democracy. The question for the US is, do you support us? There is no consideration as to whether any given country is actually democratic or not. Uh, this hypocrisy is obvious uh, to the global South and, and many other people. Biden envisioned improving on Trump's go it alone approach to build a US led so-called grand alliance of the so-called democracies to defeat the autocracies and fierce competition to ensure the free world and stop China's growing malign influence. To this end, Biden hosted a summit for democracy in December, a Zoom conference attended by 111 countries, the supposed democracies. Of course, China and Russia were not invited. Biden hoped this meeting would boost forward a practical collaboration. However, there has been little follow through in action. How effective is the Biden doctrine on its own terms? Well, you could say it seems to be working well in the countries of the Anglosphere, but not effective globally. Uh, so if you look at the Anglosphere, um, Biden has uh, consolidated political support. In the US, both Democratic and Republican parties are united in the anti-China policy. Congress passes huge military budgets and China bashing legislation with overwhelming votes. In civil society uh, in the US, liberal mainstream media outlets such as the New York Times and CNN lead the attack on human rights with constant negative messaging night and day. US public opinion has shifted from positive on China 10 years ago to two thirds negative today. The way in which the US ruling class can shape public opinion through its control of the corporate mass media frightens me. Meanwhile, racist incidents of harassment and violence against Chinese and Asian Americans keeps increasing. There was a recent uh, stabbing of an Asian American woman uh, in uh, New York City, for example, stab a murder. Outside the US, AUKUS, the new military agreement among the US, Australia, and the UK will provide nuclear powered submarines to Australia and enhanced military and technical, technical cooperation among the three countries. AUKUS is a major strategic military and political move by US imperialism to contain China's power in the region. It is also a bonanza for US weapons contractors. In the UK, the US pressured London to ban China's 5G technology and equipment claiming it could be used for spying. All the Anglosphere countries, including Canada, embraced the propaganda line weaponizing human rights. But what if we look uh, more broadly outside the Anglosphere? While the NATO countries are still subservient to the US militarily, the Biden doctrine is not so popular even among allies and friends in the uh, European Union. For example, Germany, along with France, have explored a more independent foreign policy in the Ukraine crisis. Biden's call for a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics did not catch fire. Uh, it was basically a flop. 
um, even close allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt sent, sent delegations. So where is this alliance of democracies actually operative? If you look at the global south, we see that the majority of people and countries want cooperation on critical issues, such as the pandemic, climate change, and preventing a major war. This is common sense. Majority of countries and people around the world reject a global framework of division and US-led fierce competition. It's neither just nor in their self-interest. Most countries support the trend towards a multipolar world and against hegemony. China's framework of win-win diplomacy and community for a shared future are much better suited for the increasingly multipolar world. U.S. media continually portrays China as increasingly isolated internationally, but that is not true, especially in the global south. For example, Iran and China are now implementing a 25-year cooperation agreement. Syria and Argentina recently joined the Belt and Road Initiative. And the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in November announced joint China-Africa production of 400 million doses of COVID vaccine. Thus, on a global scale, the Biden doctrine is mostly not popular, not effective. It goes against the multipolar trend of the times. So where does this leave us? Three more years of the imperialist Biden doctrine, which is bound to lead to constant tension and risk of conflict. That's not an appealing prospect, especially since there's little resistance in the US, either among progressive politicians or even the peace anti-war movement. Our job is to help build that resistance and the no Cold War movement in the US and also internationally. So Taiwan, I was asked to say something about the Taiwan issue. While the media portrays this, at least in the US, as this very difficult and attractable issue, actually it's easy to understand the principle. U.S. aggression is 99% the source of the problem, and the path to resolving the problem is simply that the U.S. has to actually implement the agreements it has already made, namely the Shanghai Communique of 1972 and the Joint Statement upon Establishing Diplomatic Relations of the U.S. and PRC in 1979. To help understand the Chinese perspective today, recall a few basic facts of history. China was long a presence in the South China Sea, and the Qing Dynasty gained control of Taiwan from the Dutch in the late 17th century. However, the Qing was defeated by Japan in the War of 1894-95, and Japan annexed Taiwan into its growing empire. During World War II, as Japan was being defeated, the big four allied reader, leaders, that is Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and Chiang Kai-shek, met and considered the post-war period in Asia. Taiwan would, would be returned to China by Japan, everybody agreed. When the United Nations was formed in 1945, China was a founding member of the Security Council and it was assumed that Taiwan was part of China. No one, including the US, ever thought otherwise. But things began to change when the Chiang Kai-shek Lent Kuomintang progressively lost the China Civil War of 1946 to 49, being defeated by the communist-led Red Army. The Kuomintang fled to Taiwan Island after being militarily defeated on the mainland. After the outbreak of the Korean War 1950, the U.S. sent its seventh fleet into the Taiwan Straits to protect Chiang Kai-shek. Most of Observers believe without U.S. military backing of the KMT, uh, the Guomindang, that is, the Red Army, with local support, would have eventually uh, taken control of the island. China has never accepted the legitimacy of the U.S. military intervention in the Chinese Civil War. And it is this U.S. intervention that created the different governments on the island and the mainland, and it is the root of the problem. But China, this is an important core issue because it deals with territorial integrity and national sovereignty. Ever since the Opium War of 1840, the Western colonial 
and imperialist strategy was to break off bits of the empire one by one to weaken and overthrow the Beijing government. For example, the British occupied Hong Kong and had a concession in, in Shanghai. Germany and Japan had a uh, concession in Shandong province. Russia and Japan exerted control over Northeast China or Manchuria. Britain tried to seize Tibet. Russia annexed considerable territory in China's northern borders in Xinjiang. Japan launched a full-scale invasion and occupation, costing more than 20 million Chinese lives. Once again, today, China sees foreign warships on the southern coast, just like the British during the Opium War. Today's imperialist pressure on Taiwan, as well as Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang, has to be seen in this historical context. Both Foreign Minister Wang Yi and China's President Xi Jinping in recent speeches have made reference to, to the so-called century of humiliation, when China was a victim of colonialism and imperialism. Those who want peace in the U.S. must repudiate the 1950 U.S. military intervention. So to fix this problem, the solution is clear. All that needs to happen is for the U.S. to fulfill the terms of the Shanghai Communique. The U.S. simply has to do what it has committed to do in writing. That is, cut back on military support for Taiwan, stop high-level official visits, stick to established protocols, don't support Taiwan independence activities, and recognize in word and deed that the People's Republic of China is the sole legitimate government of China. All business, educational, and cultural activities can proceed as usual. Instead, Biden has violated diplomatic agreements with China, such as by officially inviting to his inauguration the top Taiwanese envoy in the U.S. Sales of military equipment to Taipei have continued, and the U.S. has pushed for Taiwan's participation as an independent country in international bodies like the World Health Organization. There are continued displays of military force in the South China Sea, but China will not back down on the Taiwan question. This is the one place where China, in my opinion anyway, will fight if pushed too far, and here there is a risk of a shooting war. It is the responsibility of the U.S. to change course and fulfill its obligations according to the agreements it has signed. So in conclusion, we can probably talk about um, things to do and so forth um, uh, during the discussion period. But um, I would just like to say that uh, I hope that all the progressive people's movements and organizations join in a popular front against a new Cold War, US militarism, racism, and white supremacy, and offer an alternative agenda of economic development global cooperation and peace. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Duncan McFarland for the insightful contribution. Obviously, leave us a, a lot of um, food for thought in relation to profits. Obviously, it's one of the biggest movers on these uh, policies designed uh, for imperialist purposes also that one size doesn't fit all in relation to democracy on which grounds one country can choose how 111 countries are democratic or more democratic than others the issue of taiwan the recognition of one china policy in two systems which most sensitive people around the world shares and the lack of respect for the u.n charter where issues can be resolved by adhering to uh, the charter, by adhering to uh, the different type of agreements that have been signed internationally, and that today there is no respect for. We continue with uh, our guest speakers. Uh, I would like to invite a comrade from the Communist Party of Britain, Kenny Cole. Is a journalist currently based in the Philippines, a very interesting place to be, I believe. He lived for 20 years in China's special administrative regions of Hong Kong, 
in Macau. He is a former member of the Executive Committee of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. He's a member of the International Commission of the Communist Party of Britain and author of a number of party pamphlets on Asia and China, especially. With this, I would like to welcome you, comrade. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, comrades. Um, my presentation is going to be um, using a slideshow. So um, I think if Dennis starts, okay, there we go. So if we start on the, the first one, um, sorry, the, the second one, I should say. Um, this is a, a direct uh, quotation from our party's last Congress uh, resolution, um, which rather uh, correctly is called Halting Imperialism's Drive to War, where we make out the case for opposing British policy in relation to China, uh, specifically in relation to the militarization of the South China Sea, um, and also in relation to Hong Kong, which obviously has a particular colonial uh, connection with um, the British state. Uh, if we go to the next one. Um, one of the things which to, to follow on from Duncan's points about Taiwan, it's, it's really understated just how important China's legacy as a country divided and carved up by various uh, colonial and imperialist powers, mostly European ones, but also, of course, uh, Japan. Um, many people perhaps think that um, the colonial legacy in China was only based in, in Hong Kong. They perhaps forget Macau entirely, which was a Portuguese territory. Um, but also the colonial powers that established a system of treaty ports uh, dotted across China, which were um, essentially enclaves of colonial powers where the Chinese had no real sovereignty over their own cities, their own ports. Um, the number of countries that had those treaty ports is actually quite uh, surprisingly large. It includes the United States, France, um, uh, Imperial Germany, and so on. So this is a, a factor which is important to understand why China has been so uh, incredibly focused on uh, asserting its sovereignty over its own territory. Uh, if we go to the next one. Now, British imperial and colonial history is little known, too little known in, in Britain itself. It's perhaps better known in other places, uh, but it's not just historical. Uh, one of the factors that we are seeing with the current uh, Boris Johnson administration, uh, whether or not he lasts, is a, a turn towards um, a recovery, a recuperation of Britain's overseas roles and overseas bases, including uh, the floating of the idea of re-establishing military bases in um, the South uh, China Sea. Uh, next one. Um, we focus naturally on the most powerful imperialist power in the world, which is the United States. But it's important, I think, sometimes to look at the secondary powers. And Britain is a very, very powerful player, um, in fact. Um, too often, I think, we on the left, including in the British left, uh, tend to um, ridicule uh, Britain's pretensions, which is perhaps fair enough. But we ignore some very important features um, firstly, of course, Britain is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which gives it a veto over uh, many areas of, of UN policy. Uh, secondly, although it's a declining uh, economy, it still has roughly around $3 trillion in terms of GDP, US dollars, and is a member of the, the G7. As a military power, although Britain does not have a, a huge standing military force, it's something like the, uh, not even in the top 30, in actual fact, its military budget is uh, estimated to be the fourth largest military budget in the world. And obviously it was also a founder member of NATO. 
Uh, critically for this discussion, uh, Britain is a nuclear weapons power. Um, its Trident nuclear submarine fleet is due to be expanded and the Tories have uh, said from a review last year that Britain's nuclear arsenal will actually, actually be expanded as well. So there'll be an increased number of warheads. This is incredibly dangerous um, and goes against all um, signed treaties on things like the, the non-proliferation treaty, for example. So it's an extremely dangerous trend toward militarization. Uh, another often overlooked area is the arms industry. When we, we use the term military industrial complex, we naturally think of um, Eisenhower's references to the United States, but in fact, Britain also has its own military industrial complex. It's the second largest exporter of military hardware globally, um, mostly in the areas of uh, jet fighters and aviation. Uh, but it's a, an extremely uh, important part of the British economy. And it's one of the few areas of manufacturing uh, that wasn't uh, completely destroyed during the, the Thatcher uh, era, era in the, the 80s and into the, into the 90s. So this is a very, very important lobbying sector within the British uh, ruling class. And the final point is that um, James Bond, not with, notwithstanding, Britain's intelligence services are a key component, uh, both of NATO and also of the Five Eyes um, intelligence sharing community. This is the, the Five Eyes being the, the Anglophone uh, countries. So this is a very important factor. So Britain really is an extremely dangerous threat to peace on its own. Um, the fact that we're seeing at the moment uh, a very uh, clear pivot by the Johnson administration to act as the henchman of Biden and, and US imperialism is, um, is something that shouldn't hide the fact that Britain has considerable power on its own. It's a, 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 a significant imperialist power. Uh, next one. Uh, and again, next. So this is the, uh, the review I was talking about. It was published uh, last year in March and it commits to increasing Britain's nuclear warheads from the current 200 to 260. Uh, also quite dangerous in respect to the shift in strategy because the Tories are now saying that nuclear weapons could be used in response, not just to um, nuclear threats or conventional uh, threats, but also emerging technologies which uh, could be taken to mean uh, cyber attacks or something of the nature. The re-equipment of the Trident fleet, there are four Trident submarines and the British Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament has estimated that this will cost at least £205 billion. Um, to pick up a point made by, um, by Vinny earlier about the, the uh, waste of the armaments and industry, 205 billion pounds would pay for 120 new hospitals in Britain. So that gives you an idea of the ruling classes uh, sense priorities. And this figure actually also includes renting the Trident missiles. The missiles aren't actually owned by Britain, they're owned by the United States. And this is a, another thing which is often um, missed out when people talk about Britain's independent deterrent. In actual fact, the Trident system has always been entirely dependent on the United States. Um, I should also say in relation to that, that the, the, the nuclear reactors for the Trident uh, submarines are actually built in Britain. They're built by uh, the Rolls-Royce um, plant in, in Derby. And the new generation of Trident will have a new nuclear reactor, the PWR3. And this has actually been suggested that this will be the nuclear reactor that will be used in the Australian nuclear powered submarines. So clearly Britain and Rolls-Royce in particular are very keen for this um, thing to go forward uh, and hope to get um, uh, a cut of the, um, of the, of the budget. Next one, please. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Hong Kong. 
um, simply because for those of us um, reading the English language press or English language media, you'll know that there's been enormous campaigns uh, on Hong Kong, um, just as there have been over uh, Tibet and Xinjiang. Um, the Opium Wars brought Hong Kong into the British Empire. And as I said, the Opium Wars were then used to extend the presence of not just British, but other colonial powers into China. And one of the factors that has happened since the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty in 1997 has been the establishment and the consolidation of a pro Western, we could say an increasingly pro Washington, but traditionally pro London opposition. Um, here you see Nathan Law, who's a wanted man in Hong Kong, um, standing alongside Chris Patton, the last unelected uh, colonial governor, and Priti Patel, probably one of the most poisonous Tory uh, government ministers. Next one, please. <clears throat> Nothing. And again, the presentation in, in Western media was of a democratic, peaceful protesters up against uh, uh, police machinery that was um, intent on beating them down. In actual fact, the level of violence in Hong Kong was quite uh, astonishing. The, the biggest level of violence in political terms since. The, the late 1960s. Um, it was often said that the leadership of the, the movement was, was non-existent, that it was a spontaneous uh, movement. It was a leaderless movement. Um, but in fact, what was quite clear was the deliberate targeting of any offices of trade unions or political parties which support the One China policy. Um, this, these are photographs taken from uh, one of the uh, M, uh, yeah, MP, the alleged co-member, uh, Alice Mack, and the attacks on the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, which is the largest trade union uh, federation in, in Hong Kong. Uh, these got almost no traction, no coverage whatsoever in uh, Western media. Uh, Alice's, um, I interviewed her for the Morning Star, Alice's office was actually attacked and trashed uh, six times and um, I should also point out that in a, in a, a different um, incident, uh, there was actually an assassination attempt on one of the um, One China uh, electoral candidates who was stabbed in broad, broad daylight. Again, absolutely no coverage in Western media. Uh, next one, please. The extent of the collusion between um, the so-called pandemic, excuse me a second, I'll have to. The extent of the collusion between the pandemocratic groups and US imperialism uh, was not even a secret. It shouldn't be a secret to anybody that this was a very high profile um, uh, collusion. Um, it's not just a matter of national endowment for democracy, funds and money going into to, uh, countries. It's also the, the fact that it opens the doors to the corridors of power in Washington and Brussels and elsewhere. And you can see here the very close links between um, some of the individuals. The, the, the man in the bottom left-hand corner is Jimmy Lai, uh, often described as the uh, pro-democracy mogul. He's basically Hong Kong's Rupert Murdoch. Um, his newspapers and websites were utterly poisonous uh, against um, uh, and xenophobic against mainland Chinese. He's a right wing uh, anti communist um, without any question. And he himself has historically funded both the uh, Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions leadership, which is the pro Washington trade union, uh, which has been disbanding itself. Uh, and also a number of political figures in Hong Kong. He actually uh, was, was found to have been depositing money in their accounts. And more of this kind of collusion, I think, will be coming out quite soon. 
uh, as some of the uh, trials under the national security law happen uh, over the next uh, months. Um, and really, this is the, the picture that you need to see to understand why China introduced a national security law in the first place. It was faced with, not to put too fine a point on it, it was faced with a, a fifth column of forces inside Hong Kong that wanted to push the city to the brink, that wanted to bring it to its knees to enforce foreign intervention. They were quite clear about it. Um, Joshua Wong, who is on the top right hand corner, was absolutely clear that he wanted Trump and the Trump administration to, to intervene. Lai made many remarks about uh, saying how much he'd welcome see more CIA intervention in Hong Kong. And uh, he was a very, very strong supporter of Trump and, and wasn't too happy when, when Biden won. But in terms of their politics, Biden and Trump's pol policies towards Hong Kong seem um, uh, interchangeable. Uh, next one. Um, I mentioned the treaty ports earlier as a, as a means of um, colonialism and imperialism uh, taking control, creating enclaves of power within um, Chinese ports and cities. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which was supported by the likes of Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz and, and others, actually makes this very, very clear. Um, I think because of time, I won't read all this out, but the key points are that this was a, a, a law which was designed to allow the United States to control the port and trade of Hong Kong. Uh, and clearly that's something that is uh, completely unacceptable to any sovereign state. Uh, comments, I think uh, I've only got one slide left. And that is to thank uh, our Australian comrades for this really excellent initiative. Um, I think this is something that we should do more and more often. Unfortunately, it's becoming a political necessity apart from anything else. Um, but I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here from, uh, from the Philippines, as it turns out. So thank you very much, comrades. Thank you, Comrade Kenny. It is very insightful and really it makes me to reflect in relation to the cost of these nuclear subs. Really, it's a nightmare. It's, it's madness. If uh, to replace four Trident nuclear subs for the British uh, forces will cost about 204 billion pounds. Uh, we're talking about here in Australia about eight nuclear submarines to the cost of about 100 billion dollars. I think that we really have underestimated the cost of these uh, machines that are not needed for peaceful purposes. So the damage to the social budget when the increase or military budgets, like in the case of the of the, the UK with the fourth biggest military budget in in the world, is um, something that peacemakers and activists need to consider. Uh, how important it is for us to get involved and get more facts like this a your presentation on Hong Kong, where uh, we didn't see those pictures in our in our television, in our news uh, here in Australia. Uh, we did hear a lot about the attacks on one of the uh, federations or workers, but we never hear anything about the attacks inflicted onto the 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 federation uh, of workers. He has uh, supported the One China. A policy. So again, we talk about the the propaganda machine, the media campaign that really uh, fuses this new Cold War that we are talking about in this webinar today. And I totally agree with you. We do need to do more and more of this uh, type of uh, encounters where we involve lots of people. I'm pleased to see there that there is uh, uh, people who have joined us from China and they are uh, sharing the connection to others. 
we got people connected through Facebook Live and they wish to ask some questions at the end. Of course, we're going to facilitate that. But we got a question here for you uh, from Comrade Zachary. Um, would you share the source of the map of China with the ports and other features label, please? So Comrade's asking if you could do that for us because it's very interesting to see, uh, you know, that type of material you presented that we normally don't have access to. So uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is our own comrade, uh, Roland Bohr from Newcastle. Um, comrade um, Roland has been engaged with China for the last 15 years and has worked there since 2013. Initially, but he thought that the initially thought that the Renmin University of China in Beijing and now teaches at the School of Marxism, uh, Dalian University of Technology. So a warm welcome, Comrade Roland. I hope the situation there where you're based at the moment, where there's no affecting much, but I'm pleased that you you're here. I know that you have prepared your presentation, a video recorded presentation, just in case, um, you know, the technological problems will arise there, but um, we're happy to have you here. Welcome, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very, very much, comrades. Uh, can you hear me fine? Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to focus on a very specific topic on Xinjiang. Um, I don't think I need to say why. Uh, but I have, I'm going to begin with a few slides. So uh, if we can have the slides up, that would be good. Is Dennis there? Dennis, can we upload the, the, uh, the there? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I'm calling this a geography lesson. Um, you know, now that China is actually has stepped onto the center of the world stage, more and more people do know about its regions. But I think it might be worth looking at a few maps. So if we can go to the first map just briefly. Now, this is a Chinese map, of course, um, but we'll stay with it for a moment. You can see the red dotted line running from uh, the northeast to the southwest. Now, this is known as the Hu Huangyong line. Um, it was identified 80 years ago by a scholar called Hu Huangyong, a geographer, and he studied the history of China uh, up until in 1930s, and he identified a distinct difference on the south east of this line and the northwest. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Notably, historically, 94% of China's population uh, has lived uh, southeast of the line, and only 6% of the population to the northwest. Now, there are other differences as well, because the population uh, densities are in the cradle of Chinese civilization as well. Uh, it's also more fertile, and the major rivers are especially there, the Yellow River, and the Yangtze River or the Long River as they call it in China. The other side where the 6% live is mostly mountainous, also some semi-arid and arid areas, uh, but extremely rich in resources. And so the historical problem in China has been to link the two areas with the resources to the population centers. And the policy is known as breaking the Hu Huangyong line and integrating the two. Now, in that area where the 6% live is where most of the minority nationalities in China live. And that's the proper term from the socialist tradition. Minority nationalities, and there's 55 of them in China. So that's a crucial factor. Can we go to the next slide? Now, there's another factor that plays a role that runs across that. I've got the Hu line in red on this particular map, but I've also got a blue line 
that runs through and the red area there is Gansu province. That's known as the Hershi line, literally west of the river, west of the Yellow River. And it's a vital corridor that runs between two very high plateaus, uh, Qinghai in the south and Inner Mongolia to the north. It runs for 1200 kilometers and connected, uh, connects obviously the eastern parts, the, popular, pop, the populated parts with the northwestern part. And then you can see where the blue line goes. Then there was a northern route and a southern route, both of them in Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Now, this was an area highly contested for thousands of years. The Han Dynasty controlled it for a while, 2000 years ago, lost control. The Tang Dynasty was able to control it again and control the Western areas. But it was only in the mid 1700s that the Qing Dynasty was finally able to uh, incorporate Xinjiang area into China proper, almost 300 years ago. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise to you that this particular uh, corridor, the Hershey Corridor, was the core of the ancient Silk Road. And you have many, many sites along there that have extraordinary historical uh, evidence of the ancient Silk Road, but also it's extraordinarily important corridor for the modern Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, and thousands, I'll talk about it later, thousands and thousands of trains, for example, uh, run along that corridor before crossing the Eurasian landmass. So you can see how important economically and strategically Xinjiang is. Next slide, thanks. Right, this is just a very quick slide from the top China travel. You can now travel, of course, along the Hershey Corridor and follow the route of the ancient Silk Road. But you can also see with the two rivers, the blue line in the north is the Yellow River and the one in the south is the Yangtze, why it's called West of the River. Um, I'll just very, very briefly show two more slides. They'll be relevant later. So first one, please. Now, this is the economic growth in Xinjiang since 2010 of the last 20 years. It's averaged about 10% per year. It'll be relevant later. And the second, uh, the last one, please. And this is the population growth in Xinjiang since 2010. Okay, I'm going to move on now. I'm actually going old school. I'm going to read a printed text. So we can remove the, the slides now, thanks. I'd like to begin with a, a quotation and a story for this part, the quotation. China continues to protect and promote the rights of all minorities in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. And now for the story. And not long after the Kunming Railway Station massacre in March of 2014, I was teaching a class in Beijing. Now, the massacre was perpetrated by about a dozen Uyghur terrorists who killed 31 people with knives and injured 140 others. And it was just one of thousands of such incidents over that 20 year period. In my class was a young Uyghur student. Uh, she and her sister are both from Xinjiang and they were studying in Beijing at the time. And during a presentation to the class, she gave an impassioned speech. Islam is a religion of peace and not violence, she said. I'm a Uyghur and I'm proud to be Chinese. In fact, the vast majority of Uyghur people see themselves as part of China and condemn the terrorists, she went on to say. Now, I've begun with the quotation and the story since they raise two very important points concerning Marxist analysis of the problems in Xinjiang and how to solve them. And that is to say, Marxist analysis by Chinese specialists. Now, these two points concern the preferential policies for minority nationalities in socialist countries and a Marxist approach to human rights. Now, as for minority nationalities, the Uyghur student said that the vast majority of Uyghur people see themselves as part of China, as Chinese. Why did she make this point? I'll just skip. A major feature of all socialist countries since the earliest days of the Soviet Union has been preferential policies for minorities. These include high levels of autonomy and governance, economic ass assistance support, fostering of languages, education, culture, and so on. 
And in China, this has also meant exempting minorities from the recently abolished one child policy. And so, for example, uh, and referred that graph earlier revealed this in the last 40 years, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang has doubled. Now we need to be careful here and avoid seeing this situation from Western, a Western colonialist perspective. These preferential policies are not simply promoted by a government for minorities who are outside the structures of power. Instead, the policies arise from the fact that minorities are very much embodied in the structures of governance. In China, all minorities are represented in the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conferences and can be elected to the five levels of People's Congresses. So the student in my class was alluding to her personal experience of these preferential policies. At the time, she came from a relatively poor region of China. Parts of Xinjiang were then still mired in absolute poverty. And the preferential policies had given her and her sister an opportunity to study in Beijing. At the same time, these policies have also produced some profound contradictions. Now, there's many aspects of these contradictions, and I can't go into them all, but one is crucial. As you saw from the maps earlier, many of the minority nationalities in China live in remote border regions to the west of, or the northwest of the Hu Huangyong line. And as a result, many of them have lagged behind in China's rapid economic development. You know, hundreds of millions of lives have been improved in the uh, southwest of the line, but e uh, northeast of the line, in the sparsely populated border regions, uh, poverty was still a problem more than a decade ago. Now, this, this is despite all the efforts at economic assistance of these parts, including Xinjiang. It remained quite unsat unsatisfactory. And this is where the quotation now becomes important that I quoted earlier, China continues to protect and promote the rights of all minorities in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Yes, there are many minorities in Xinjiang, 13 originally, 47 in total. But rights, human rights, for those of us who've been brought up in the few Western countries of the world, all of them former colonizers, human rights automatically brings to mind freedom of expression, uh, movement and assembly. I don't want to spend any time with this very thin notion, except to note that it's based on the right to private property, as Marx and Engels already identified. But there is another tradition of, of human rights as part of the Marxist approach and is promoted vigorously in China. Now, the roots are anti-colonial and anti-hegemonic sovereignty shared by all colonized countries, but the core human right is the right to subsistence, to socioeconomic well-being, to common prosperity. Now, there's key moments in the development of this approach. Engels, 1843, the purpose of socialism is to guarantee the subsistence of the proletariat. Stalin in 1936, that the, the uh, foundation of all rights is freedom from exploitation. Everything else is meaningless if a person is haunted by the fear of being tomorrow deprived of work and of home and of bread. Instead, socialism seeks a prosperous and cultured life for all. Or we can note the slogan from the Jiangxi Fujian Soviet in the late 20s and early 30s, um, make sure that people have a roof over their heads, food, clothes and warmth in winter, and they'll become communists. Deng Xiaoping's point that poor socialism is not socialism at all. And today, it's the policy of common prosperity. Now, if you'd like to know more, you need to look in other areas. There's plenty of information about this now. Uh, perhaps the best place is the uh, website of the China Society for Human Rights Studies, chinahumanrights.org. Um, and there's a rapidly increasing amount of material, accurate, factual material about the situation in China uh, in many, many places. One example, there's an army of vloggers uh, from England and the United States who, uh, young people who now live in China and have taken up vlogging with hundreds of thousands of followers showing what life in China is actually like, uh, rather than all of the, uh, you know, complete uh, web of lies and misrepresentations that you find in Anglo media especially. But anyway, what's all this uh, stuff about Marxist approach to human rights got to do with Xinjiang? 
Uh, ever since uh, Xinjiang has been part of China in the mid 1700s, it's been extremely strategic, but plagued by periodic difficulties. And then in the mid 1990s, uh, these were escalated with the spread of uh, Islamic radicalism among, among some parts of the population. Um, weapons, drugs, trained fighters passed across the remote and mountainous borders with neighbouring countries. And from the mid-1990s till about five years ago, there were thousands of terrorist incidents, mostly targeted at other Uyghur people. The response? To begin with, the immediate question was safety, stability and social harmony. A new governor was appointed with a reputation for getting things done. And as a result, for the last five years or so, there have been no terrorist incidents. But how is this Marxist? Achieving social stability is simply a prerequisite for economic development. The analysis by many scholars and policymakers was that the root cause of the unrest and difficulties in Xinjiang was endemic poverty especially outside the cities. With limited job opportunities, young people especially would be attracted to extremist views and engage in separatist, separatist and terrorist activities. And as a result of these conclusions, many angles were developed and these require long-term devoted work to improve the socioeconomic conditions. Quality of education was improved so as to enable young people to find jobs. And this, of course, includes ideological education in Marxism, and especially among the Uyghur, also in religion, believe it or not. Some of the main teachers are, in fact, uh, imams. Um, there were uh, job opportunities increased for young men and women, and incomes have been rising at around 10 to 15 percent per year. Further, young CPC members volunteered to work in poor villages, so to develop targeted programs in light of concrete conditions, uh, so people could uh, be lifted out of poverty. And in Xinjiang, where some of the most intractable poverty in China was, was to be found, finally was finally declared a free of poverty in late 2020. And you should note that the Chinese definition of poverty is more comprehensive than that of the World Bank. Now, the most significant project here is the Belt and Road Initiative launched in neighboring Kazakhstan in 2013. Now, I think we know that the BRI has many dimensions, but Xinjiang, as those maps should have shown, is a linchpin. Nearly all of the long distance freight trains running across the Eurasian landmass, and there are thousands of these trains now run through Xinjiang. As a hub of the new Silk Road, Xinjiang's economy has been booming. Now, while the figures for 2020 are a bit lower due to the pandemic, for the last actually 10 years, I've got five years here, but 10 years, the economy in Xinjiang has grown at a rate of about 10% per year. And just before the pandemic hit, as a sign of this in 2019, more than 100 million visitors from other parts of China and internationally went to Xinjiang. So a question remains in light of all of this, why have the Western imperialist powers, I've got declining and fragmenting here, but um, given up on the Dalai Lama and made Xinjiang the flavor of the month, deploying the old anti-communist playbook of atrocity propaganda. By now the answer should be obvious. Xinjiang is at last realizing the, more, the core Marxist human right to socioeconomic well-being or common prosperity. And for Western imperialists, this is intolerable. As a footnote, in 2016, Sinopec, uh, the, the huge state-owned enterprise, um, announced the discovery of massive oil and gas fields in the Tarim Basin in Xinjiang, with more discovered in 2020. This is one of the largest reserves of oil and gas in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Roland. Very interesting talk and in addressing the issue of Xinjiang. It is so important because there has been the excuse on the issue of human rights, but this dispels the issue of uh, the attacks of genocide. So, you graph uh, that presents the 
the growth of the population in, in that area with the Uyghurs, it is important because the only information we receive here is what the propaganda machine want us to, to see. And we are convinced that a lie when it is presented on and on and on, people tend to, to believe it. Um, the issue of poverty, uh, it was a, such an achievement for China to the elimination of extreme poverty well ahead the, the targets of the millennia. The, you know, lifting all these millions of people out of poverty, the, a huge population, 1.4 billion. The responsibility of that government every morning to think that 1.4 billion people have to enjoy breakfast, we have three meals a day, a roof over their heads. It does, that is impressive. Without um, a fear of being labeled from China, that's how the debate about China goes. Pro-China, against China. Is China socialist? Is China capitalist? It, it tends to be a destruction, particularly in the peace and anti-war movement, the facts are there. China has achieved enormous targets. It has been able to provide to their people. It has been able to express solidarity all over the world with medical brigades, with the initiative of infrastructure. There are many countries are taken up here in, in Australia, unfortunately, the, the Victorian government has signed on to it. But the politics of the government in turn uh, mean that there is now no uh, prospect for the, uh, for the Victorian government to be part of the Belt and Road that has uh, helped many countries. Nicaragua uh, recently uh, recognized uh, China. Uh, again, in strengthening the relationships and the possibilities, enormous possibilities for the building of a new canal, for example. But it is a shared future. The resources, the limited resources the world has, really have to be shared for the benefit of working people all over the world. Uh, the cost that China has paid, the millions of people, millions of volunteers, they have paid the ultimate sacrifice for the right to self-determination, for the right to independence, for the right to be able to build a better, a better country, a better future for their people. It is, yes, amazing. And it is there for us to see. The Anglo-Saxon alliance that fuels with racism this international a class struggle. It is other issue that we need to, to consider in our analysis, and we need to look um, in the debate with, with the people we work, because we do want these broad alliances to stop the new Cold War, to stop um, the treaties like AUKUS, the Quad, you know, the, the, the military alliances uh, for the benefit of imperialist power. Uh, it is the time for attendees to send us the questions for you to participate and ask uh, any of the guest speakers uh, questions. We have uh, uh, from Facebook, it's the time for Comrade Shane, as if we could ask a question. If you're listening there, please send us that question there. Um, we probably have um, a few more minutes uh, for comrades to, to ask any questions. But I would like to ask any of the any of the guests because he would like to say a, a few final words um, uh, while we wait for any of the questions there. If anybody wants to you know, talk about any of the other issues. Uh, Comrade Andrew, put it up. 
Yeah, I thought it was very important. Uh, some of the contribution I had was about an organisation in Australia called ASPE, which is heavily funded by the armaments industry and effectively has become our Conservative government's external foreign affairs advisor. Very nasty bit of work it is. And it produced a lot of the material on um, the Uyghurs, a lot of the evidence that used by a, a number of countries. Um, the most significant defence against uh, all the propaganda was the uh, Pakistan uh, foreign affairs representative who was cornered by Western press uh, saying, why aren't you supporting the Muslims in, in uh, Xinjiang, um, in the province? And they said, well, we uh, are part of the Belts and Roads, obviously. But we visit that province all of the time and uh, we meet with the people, we talk to their representatives, we visit the whole, whole province and the Western press are telling lies. Now, this is a representative, not, a, not of a communist country or necessarily a progressive government, but they said, as Muslims, we consider what's being in, done in, in uh, Xinjiang as a significant success that we wish to emulate through belts and roads. And the West just is spreading lies. So I think that's a, a, a very good example of the difference between uh, Western complacency and, and, and uh, what the developing world consider China is trying to achieve. Thank you, Comrade Andrew. If oh, can I add? Comrade Ron, yeah. Briefly, there are thousands and thousands of journalists and politicians have been to Xinjiang, um, and including from Muslim majority countries like Pakistan. And um, they all support China's policies there, not just because they've got similar problems, uh, but also they can see the benefits. Thank you, Comrade Ron. We, we got. Um, uh, three questions here. Uh, the first one is uh, from Lenin. Uh, we have seen lots of these Cold War propaganda techniques in the past with the USSR, for example. What is the same and what has changed in this rolling narrative against communism over time? Uh, do you want to, who wants to answer that question? And do you put the hand up? No. Yeah, I just, um, there's, there's probably many examples. Um, I was particularly taken with uh, something that was raised about the Hong Kong situation in Australia uh, during the long campaign on Hong Kong. Uh, of course, there's a, a number of ultra left within Australia that uh, uh, ventured uh, claims of support for the opposition in Hong Kong. But because of the wanton destruction of public property, you know, railway stations and, and, and other um, uh, property owned by the people in Hong Kong, and particularly the very terrible attacks on ordinary people on the street who opposed those groups, and it was obvious from the news reports that old people, women, um, were just viciously attacked. That, uh, and of course, the fact that absolutely none of the claims of the protesters were for better conditions for workers, for uh, fairer employment conditions, for better accommodation. Um, none of them, none of those groups put forward any of those sort of claims which would be the basis of our support, um, that even those ultra-left groups could not get uh, a unified position to support the demonstrations in Hong Kong. So that was an outstanding example of even with the overwhelming media um, attack, 
that um, the movement in Australia was unwilling to commit to supporting the demonstrators in Hong Kong. Thank you, Comrade Andrew. Um, with this, Comrade, um, it, there's another question here in the chat. Um, in light of the recent banging of the anti-communist drum, how should we react? So that's very linked to the first question, I thought. Andrew, do you want to? That was a mistake. I forgot to take it down. Okay. Yeah, so how should we react? You know, we communists uh, in our countries, uh, there's a lot of anti-communism. There's a lot of banging drum. The uh, rates under the bed, uh, particularly now here, and uh, our own prime minister. How should we react uh, about this anti-communism? Any thoughts on this? Yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, we we got the experience from the past uh, in our countries, in particular here in Australia, uh, the 50s, the banning of of the of the Communist Party, uh, the banning of the party in Ukraine and other countries in Europe. So the, the anti-communism is there, is present, is right, uh, the rise of fascism. Uh, it is something that our organizations, uh, like communist parties, uh, need to think about this, uh, how uh, to combat and how to protect our organizations and our activity. Um, there is a, a question here from Kamara Hanna. Uh, Kamara Roland mentioned the impact of bloggers can he and Comrade Duncan please comment on how much impact this is having and could have? Comrade Roman. Well, <clears throat> I, I would say something maybe in partly in relation to the previous question about. Um, about anti-communism that one thing that um, <clears throat> we are trying to do here well at least here in the Boston area where I am is we are building up the people-to-people um, -people friendship um, activities um, so that uh, for, for example uh, focusing on cooperation on climate change where in in fact, both the U.S. and um, China issued a statement at Glasgow saying that they wanted to uh, cooperate to combat um, global warming. So that is an issue that has very broad appeal and, uh, um, it, and has a people-to-people -people emphasis that avoids sort of debates about, um, you know, the Communist Party of China and so forth. And we're hoping, I know in the CPUSA, we're hoping that when travel to China is again possible, because it's so difficult now with the pandemic and the quarantines and so forth, but we're hoping to be able to um, organize and receive people-to-people -people delegations, which are educational and cultural in nature. So I think that's one way by um, establishing direct people-to-people -people ties that we can um, have some effect on US public opinion and sort of avoid this sort of anti-communist rhetoric. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Comrade Roland. Yeah, just in, in response, I think, in part to Comrade Hannah's um, uh, question, although I think it was directed to some of the other comrades here as well, uh, there's a very interesting phenomenon developing. Um, it's partly, I think, because a lot of young people, um, and for me, that's anyone under 40, um, uh, really don't follow mainstream 
news in Western countries. And there's uh, quite a large number of expats uh, who live in China now, young people, 20s, 30s, uh, from England, from US, from elsewhere, uh, because job opportunities are better there. Um, you know, they've got a partner, they might have children. And um, they've started doing vlogs, just everyday life. You know, what's it like living in China? Well, there's no homeless people. Um, you know, there's 40,000 kilometres of high-speed trains, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's one... Uh, uh, who runs one called Living in China, and um, his name is Jason, and uh, he lives in Kunming, capital of Yunnan province in the southwest, um, and um, he has a segment called BBS, British Bullshit, um, and as a taker, uh, you know, has a go at the BBC, he puts on a grey filter, and uh, he's actually caught the attention of some of the papers in the UK, and also the BBC itself trying to suggest that he and the other vloggers are in the pay of the Communist Party of China or, you know, this, that, and the other. So they're having a lot of fun because it's very personal. They just absolutely take it to pieces. Now, his own particular vlog, and there's others, has about 350,000 followers. Um, and this is internationally. This is, you know, because he's done it in English, he has Chinese subtitles. Um, it'd be interesting to see how this phenomenon goes. Um, it's not, you know, there's no talk of communism or Marxism. It's just about what everyday life is like. Um, so there's a whole aspect of that, that um, especially yeah, some of us older people in the, in the party, uh, probably I'm, I can't do that sort of stuff, vlogging and all that sort of thing um, that, that is developing and may have more of an impact. I don't know. Thank you, Comrade Roland. With this, uh, a couple of questions, people asking if this is being recorded. Yes, we're recording and it is also live stream to Facebook, which you can watch again or share with your networks. Also, we're going to post um, the video. There are important contributions there that can be you know, shared and, and, and listened again. Uh, so that answers that question. Uh, Comet uh, Floyd is asking if uh, he's in more in, he's interested uh, to learn more about Biden's Democracy Summit, and in particular, what sort of countries attended. Uh, obviously, it was a comment, um, Duncan, uh, comment Duncan probably could uh, elaborate a little bit more, but apart from the 111 countries, uh, the rest, about 80 countries were left out. Do you want to mention a few of the countries, comrades, who attended? Well, um, in terms of who attended, uh, of course, that was based upon the Western countries. <clears throat> but I think the um, Biden or the U.S. basically invited any country in the world that was either friendly to the West, perceived as friendly to the West, or at least neutral. And, and so there was a very wide net. Um, However, of course, all that was really required was to um, send an official to attend a Zoom meeting, one Zoom meeting. Um, not all that different than this one, actually. So most countries um, who were invited did send a representative. Now, I can't, you know, offhand, I don't, you know, outside the Western coast sort of sphere, um, I would have to check and see a list of the countries. But I think that the um, Democracy Summit looked good in that 111 countries attended, but actually in a lot of ways was kind of a flop because nothing really came out of it. Um, in terms of what impact did it actually have upon the actions of other countries uh, who attended, um, the, the impact is, is, is negligible. They, they all seem to sort of go ahead and uh, uh, pursue whatever policies they wanted to. So this kind of idea that you'd have a coalescence of this grand alliance of, you know, over a hundred countries fighting for democracy against the autocracies um, didn't really materialize. So I don't think you're going to see much more of the supposedly grand alliance for democracy. 
Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Thank you. Um, hopefully that answers that question. But obviously, those countries in the in the hemisphere of the influence of the of the United States, uh, you know, you could see no such democracies attending like uh, Colombia, for example, where trade unionists and social activists are killed every day, and there is no uh, allegations of human rights violations, for example. Um, uh, Hanna got a question, which is relevant for us working in the peace movement, anti-war movement, uh, for Comrade Kenny and Comrade Duncan, if they could please could uh, give us an indication of the attitudes towards China uh, of peace and progressive groups in the respective countries. So how do you see it? How, what is your experience on this? Uh, shall I come in first? All right, Comrade Kenny, yep, go on. Um, obviously, I'm I'm speaking as a as a, a kind of exile because uh, I'm currently in the Philippines rather than in, in Britain. Uh, but I'd say that over the, you know the biggest challenges at the moment are we also face a kind of bipartisan, in fact, it's it's a multi-partisan uh, united front against uh, China on the issues of Hong Kong and uh, Xinjiang, in particular. Um, within the Labour Party, there's obviously been a massive shift back to the right um, in, in terms of foreign policy, a very, very stridently pro-NATO position, pro-US position, almost indistinguishable from, from the Tories. Um, I know that within uh, the peace movement, there's been a much, um, there's been some very good positions taken by uh, CND, uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament. Uh, also good positions taken by the Stop the War Coalition, uh, which are just very basic about trying to dial down the rhetoric uh, against the militarization, against the, uh, the use, for example, of the, the Royal Navy in South China Sea, <coughs> and so on. Um, but I do think we face, to go back to some of the other questions, which kind of fit in here. We do face an ideological challenge, um, given that there is this anti-China attitude on the left and um, the ultra-left playing a, the role of foot soldiers here of imperialism. There's no real other way to put it. Um, I think Duncan was, was correct. I think it was Duncan who said, you know, as, as China reopens again, people will be able to go back and see for themselves. Um, it's very important, I think, that we encourage peace and especially labour and trade union uh, delegations to China and to Hong Kong in particular, because I think that when people see what the reality is on the ground, when they can talk to people, um, when they break through this incredible wall of lies about uh, China in, in almost every area, um, I think that's a really um, very, very important point, because I do think that it, that it reaches a point where people begin to either see, th that, that, that becomes either a kind of propaganda fatigue, that people are absolutely fed up with this endless and cycle of anti-China news stories, um, or they really do begin to see the, the gaps in the logic. And if we can begin to... Uh, show the reality of, of Chinese life. And that is why these bloggers that, that Roland mentioned are so incredibly important. And they have been attacked uh, wholesale by um, the Western media, by the BBC, the Guardian has had features uh, trying to smear these, these people because they're able to show video of life in Urumqi or to, to show what it's like in a, sec a small secondary or tertiary city in China. And it's a complete contrast to everything that we're being shown on CNN or on the BBC or what we read in, in the media. So unfortunately, I think China's not gonna be opening up very quickly, but I do think that we should be thinking in terms of people to people exchanges um, and that's, a, a, that's going to be one of the, the, the strongest ways of breaking down the anti-China and the anti-communist um, propaganda. Thank you, Comrade Kenny. Comrade Duncan? 
the peace and anti-war movement in the United States um, is has a big difference or even a split on the question of um, no Cold War on China. And the difference is one, po one position, which is the position of the CPUSA, um, identifies US imperialism as the aggressor and China as reacting in a defensive mode for example, in its activities in the South China Sea. It's not necessary to agree with everything China does, but it's important to see that they perceive, perceive themselves as you know, you know, defending their core national interests uh, you know, against US hegemony. The second position is that um, sees two superpowers battling each other. Um, that the trend towards more tension, possibly conflict or war, there's mutual responsibility. Um, both China and the US are responsible. Um, and so this is a very deep difference, which I think is very related to anti-communism. And um, so the, pro the problem is that while uh, there is agreement that war is a bad thing um, there and both sort of groups would uh, certainly oppose a war on China very definitely. There's very little agreement on anything else. Um, and so from my point of view, if you talk about the two superpowers in a kind of a struggle, it, it subtracts the whole a concept of justice out of the entire um, equation that that a country has a right to defend itself. Um, many people in the U.S. peace and anti-war movement w would not uh, utter a sentence that sounds like they are in any way defending China's rights. Uh, so I think one thing the peace and anti-war movement in the U.S needs to do is it needs to broaden its concept of what peace is, um, seeing that um, justice and peace are uh, um, kind of two sides of the same issue and appeal more towards, for example, people of color organizations in the United States, um, African-American, African, uh, activist organizations and so forth are uh, having been victims of US capitalism in the past are much more skeptical about the uh, anti-China propaganda and much more open-minded. So uh, I think the um, peace anti-war movement in the United States really has to broaden um, what it thinks of as its constituency, make a much more concerted effort to work with people of color and working class organizations in the United States. But right now you have a few, you have some organizations such as No Cold War, um, which you know comes out of Britain as an excellent organization. So uh, there is some, very good information being put out by the anti-imperialist wing of the anti-war movement um, opposing a no cold war but i think the messaging coming out of the traditional peace movement which has a very large white middle class component is is much more sort of ambiguous so it's, it's not a real great situation in the peace movement, I, re, I regret to say at this time. So, so I, but I think education is, is really important uh, because there's just a huge amount of misunderstanding about what is actually going on in China. Thank you, Comrade Duncan. I think that you nailed the uh, why at the beginning, Comrade, Kenny also suggested that we need more of these events for people to get informed for, for ourselves to get educated and and really try to overcome this 
the propaganda machine and the misinformation. Uh, so people in the left, uh, we can live in peace and for people in the right to attract more uh, to this broad effort for peace and anti-war. We got a final question here. Uh, what with the justification by the federal government uh, preventing the Victorian state government uh, into the Belt and Road program? That comes from from people following us on Facebook. I don't know, uh, Andrew, would you like to touch base on, on this? Um, I don't think I don't think there is or was any justification. Um, it, it basically, from the Victorian government's perspective, was a expression of interest on behalf of the Victorian government to participate. So um, I, I think that um, all uh, it was a media exercise for the federal government because. Uh, it's enacted a number of uh, uh, legislations to uh, stop foreign interference. But the only country, of course, that's ever mentioned is China. Um, it's, been, it's been a huge embarrassment this week. It, I mean, it's an embarrassment most of the time, but there's been a huge embarrassment this week. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, over a long period of time when it comes to the positions being taken by both the federal conservative government and the op opposition Labor Party in their approach towards a lot of these media issues uh, where they uh, continually contend but have exactly the same position on attacking China, on... Uh, going along with the uh, stream of material that comes across all platforms in Australia about the Ukraine and what's happening in the Ukraine. We just, every, every news report is that a war's going to start in the Ukraine. A war's going to start in the Ukraine. It's just incredible, um, the uh, intense. This morning, we get a news report um, of a Chinese ship uh, uh, military ship uh, transiting through the Timor Straits, shining a laser on an Australian uh, mil military reconnaissance plane. It's just amazing. Yet, in Parliament this week, um, the uh, Conservative government in the lead up to a federal election has been accusing uh, or saying that the Labor Party is the preferred government in Australia for China at a time when we know they've just announced how, ma how many contributions have come from from various donors and a large chunk of it isn't actually stated. But we know there's been many reported cases of huge amounts of money being paid over uh, to both political parties um, from Chinese business people. I mean, that's that's what... Uh, the, the head of our intelligence agency just happened to mention, you know, his main report, he just happened to mention that some country had interfered uh, and it, it was Chinese and it was to the Labor Party, but then was horrified when the, the, our government took it up and used it to attack, attack the opposition. But the reality is that both parties have a common extreme position on China and other countries, and um, it, it's it's a very bad position considering China is our biggest trading partner, and uh, as a business, they're our best friends when it comes to business. Yet we're only too willing too willing to attack. So, <clears throat> a, a minor agreement of the Victorian government just becomes a propaganda tool. Um, I, I just wanted to, we were talking about media and the ability of media. Uh, about a month ago from the Cuban comrades, we got a, <coughs> a production on the belts and roads in Cuba. And it was really a great, 
great production, short production. It showed how the Chinese government, uh, uh, as part of the initiative, had helped the Cuban uh, industry develop digital plug-in equipment and for manufacturing in Cuba. So they were digitising the media network across Cuba. Also, they were contributing to the development of significant energy generation uh, by environmentally sound means. So they were helping the Cuban, um, the Cuban um, electricity industry develop new alternative forms of power within Cuba. Very good production. So, you know, there is a, a number of excellent productions that are going around that are being produced by a number of media outlets that really do expose the threats of Cold War politics against a lot of countries. I mean, the campaign um, against sanctions is critical, especially during the, the time of COVID. That was a critical issue where they allowed countries to suffer just for political purposes. Um, that, that those sort of things um, are a really good example and a, a good way to show the difference between the support of uh, China and uh, the follow-up politics of AUKUS. So I think I think they're very good examples. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Andrew. And we needed the two-hour uh, block for this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank all the uh, guest speakers. Wonderful. Thank you for the effort to joining us. We do need to do more of this. Um, I also would like to take a minute just to let people know our party is hosting this 14th National Congress in next weekend. Uh, there will be a, a public opening event. Uh, uh, in a way of a webinar and also through Facebook on Friday the 25th of February from 6 p.m. Uh, Sydney time. So we have an opportunity to invite all party members to participate uh, due to restrictions by the pandemic. Uh, we won't be able to have a face-to-face -face event, but uh, we will have the opportunity to involve or the party membership to participate in this opening event with international speakers, with fraternal parties. Uh, we have sent the, the written or video messages uh, that will be shared there. Uh, some of the diplomatic uh, representations in, in Canberra will join us. Uh, so I would like to invite people to, to join us in this celebration of our Congress. It is a uh, a very important event for our party we, now that we have uh, reached 101 years of the foundation of the Communist Party of Australia with all the difficulties that we obviously share in, in economies like the United States and Britain and Australia. This uh, we are, uh, There is a lot of anti-communism and we are to be able to pass our message it is it is difficult at times, but important. And some uh, something that we have experienced uh, at three parties has been the recent growth of membership. That shows it's not a, it's not unusual. It is that people are waking up that there is a solution, and the solution is that we need to fight for socialism. We need to get rid of the system. With this. I would like to thank you, comrades. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you to people that follow us on, on social media. Until next time, all the best. Stay safe.